ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय भक्ति वैदांत स्वामी प्रभुपाद दि फाउंडर आचार्य ऑफ इस्कॉन श्रील प्रभुपाद begins this purport by speaking of regulated occupational duties this refers to activities within the varnashram system in the modern age there is no varnashram system however the essence of the mode of goodness can be understood anyway from the rest of the purport means that action should be performed without attachment for the results one should do one's uh, prescribed duties without being attached to any material resu- material enjoyment as a result and specifically here it said that the action should be performed in krishna consciousness now usually there is a distinction between the mode of goodness and krishna consciousness the mode of goodness is technically called sattva gun it is one of the three qualities of material nature tamagun means the mode of ignorance it is very lowly and abominable much better much more advanced than the mode of ignorance is rajagun or the mode of passion and much better than rajagun is sattva gun or the mode of goodness and much better than sattva gun is shuddha sattva or pure krishna consciousness sattva gun means the quality of goodness in material life shuddha sattva means completely goodness that is fully purified from any traces of material contamination and here prabhupad writes about uh the mode of goodness referring to actions performed in krishna consciousness this means that uh, ultimately the mode of goodness is meant for coming to krishna consciousness there can't really be any goodness without krishna consciousness now we often read in the shastras about great sages who fall down to to the attraction of women or prestige or something like this and by reading these stories you may get the impression that the rishis are mostly falling down all the time but actually the rishis they're very saintly people and generally they don't fall down from their position in fact it's so unusual that it's been recorded in the shastra such cases just to show as examples that even those people who are very exalted in the mode of goodness they can fall from their position if they're not careful However when a person becomes completely purified from all material contamination then he is not liable to fall down but even then if he again allows material contamination to enter his heart he is subject to falling down to the lower modes however a person who is fully in krishna consciousness he is less not likely to be influenced by the lower modes of material nature even though superficially he may appear to be influenced by the modes of nature even a great devotee of the lord when he comes to this material world becomes subject at least superficially to the influence of this material world for instance a uh, pure devotee if he goes out in the rain he'll get wet it's not that because he's a pure devotee he won't get wet but rather because he's a pure devotee he won't be disturbed as someone else might be And then you may say well sometimes when You may have heard stories of Prabhupada how he would chastise his disciples for making a small mistake. So you may think, well, it sounds like he's disturbed by the modes of nature. But actually he was just teaching his disciples how to do everything very nicely for Krishna. If we hear about Prabhupada becoming very angry, it's not that he's becoming angry because he's influenced by the modes of material he nature. But he's angry because he's not influenced by the modes of material nature. Yes. And he wants his disciples also to be free from the influence of material nature. So if you do something stupid, which being in a mode of ignorance, he'll snap you out of it. Now, the activities of a Krishna conscious person and the activities of a materialist may in many ways seem to be similar. In fact, to give the example of Srila Prabhupada again, it may seem that in many ways he was a person in the mode of passion. working very hard working very hard and getting many followers living in opulent surroundings always making plans how so, to spread his movement discussing 
accounts and movements of money, becoming angry if disciples don't follow instructions properly, condemning the bogus incarnations of God, condemning the mundane scientists and the uh, mundane scholars who deny Krishna. Maybe, maybe you know Sada Puta Prabhu. If you know English, you can you can get this joke. He he calls the mundane scholars squalors. Squalor. You have to know English well enough to get the joke. Squalor means like filthy, dirty, something which is ah, filthy, yeah. dirty. Yes, Do you have that word in your language? Okay, Living in squalorship. Squalor, squalor means dirty, filthy, so he calls them squalors. It's a, it's a pun. Play on words. Not exactly, not exactly a pun. I don't know what the word is. So, it may appear that Prabhupada is very much in the mode of passion, but he's far, far beyond the mode of passion and far, far beyond the material mode of goodness because he is doing everything simply for the satisfaction of Krishna. So, this is the training in the mode of goodness to do, thing with, to do everything without any personal motive. A person who is being trained in the mode of goodness is trained not to be attached to anything, to be beyond the dualities of material nature, to be equipoised in heat or cold, in gain or loss. That's why we were discussing the yogis, they meditate sitting in the icy cold river. And in the summer with the sun beating on you at 45 degrees, they build four fires around themselves and meditate. In this way they learn to tolerate heat and cold. But this is practice in the mode of goodness. But simply by becoming detached from material dualities doesn't bring us to the perfection of life. If we become detached from everything material, but then we don't develop our attachment, our spiritual attachment for Krishna, then we become impersonalists. And generally we find that the impersonalists, those who are serious impersonalists, they tend to be in the mode of goodness. They very strictly follow rules and regulations of purity. They're very careful about which water they drink. They won't take water from a well used by people who are not clean. They're very careful to take baths regularly wash their clothes regularly. In every way, they, they try to be very much in the mode of goodness. However, it's all useless, ultimately. Because if it's not pleasing to Krishna, then what is the use of it all? You may be performing your religious duties very nicely, but if you don't have a taste for hearing about Krishna, then it's simply a useless endeavor. So that's why if you come to the mode of goodness but you don't transfer your attachment to Krishna, then ultimately you fall down from even from the mode of goodness. So in the material mode of goodness the training is to become detached from everything material. But then having done that you have to come to the positive point which is to become attached to Krishna. Mm. Otherwise, if you follow all the rules and regulations of the Bar national system without worshipping Krishna, then you simply fall down. One may, without worshipping the Supreme Lord, then even if one is following all the rules and regulations, then he falls. Down, he ultimately falls from his position. In this Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes the modes of material nature and their effects in some detail. But ultimately he is teaching us to go beyond the material modes of nature oh. and even beyond the mode of goodness Google. and to come to the highest platform of the living being which is love of Krishna. Now, the mode of goodness means Brahminical life. But if one is a very good Brahmin but he doesn't love Krishna, then he's not dear to Krishna. In fact, even if one is born in a family of dog eaters, but he takes up Krishna consciousness. He is in a much more exalted position than a very high class Brahmana who is not inclined towards Krishna. This Palad Maharaj says that one may be a very high class Brahmana decorated with all good qualities of a Brahmana such as tolerance, self-control, honesty, religiousness, study of the scriptures, peacefulness. He may have so many good qualities, but if he is inimical to the service of the lotus feet of Krishna, then he is not in nearly as good a position as someone born in the most abominable family of a dog-eater. 
if that dog eater has taken to Krishna consciousness, because that person in the family of a dog eater, he can purify, by taking up Krishna consciousness, he can purify not only himself, but many generations of his family. Whereas a brahmana, even having so many good qualities, he can't even purify himself if he's not Krishna consciousness. So Krishna is teaching us ultimately to come to the platform of Krishna consciousness. This is very practical for all of us, because we're coming from the lower modes of nature. For us, the mode of passion is more exalted. <laughs> we're mostly coming out of the lowest mode, the mode of ignorance, thick ignorance. So that if we come out to the mode of passion, we think, well, now I've become very exalted. You want to speak of the mode of goodness, we can hardly imagine. But by Krishna consciousness, we leap up over the modes of nature, by Krishna's grace. One who engages, engages in Krishna's unflinching devotional service, undivided devotional service, and takes up the mode of service to Krishna and Bhakti Yoga, then he crosses over the modes of material nature and automatically comes to the equipoise position. So this is the uh, mercy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Otherwise, in Kali Yoga, everyone is very fallen. But by the mercy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, even the most fallen can come up beyond the mode of goodness. In this Kali Yoga, it's rare to see manifestations of the mode of goodness. Mostly people are in the very lowest modes of life. But the devotees of Lord Chaitanya, even though they may come from the very lowest backgrounds, they become the most exalted people by His grace. Now, on the other hand, we should also try to understand what are the practices of the mode of goodness that will help us to live a more civilized life which is suitable for cultivating Krishna consciousness. There are many rules and regulations in Vedic life. If we try to implement them all in our movement, then we'll all go crazy. But as much as possible, if we try to follow these things, that will help us to advance towards the goal of Krishna consciousness. And many of the rules and regulations followed by smarter Brahmins in the mode of or practicing the rules and regulations of the mode of goodness, many of them are the same as or very close to those of the devotees. Such as rising early in the morning, taking bath, studying the scripture, bowing down before Guru, Sadhu, Vaishnavas, father, mother. These are observed by non-devotees in the mode of goodness. In fact, in Vedic culture, most of the people follow this. Not even necessarily all the highest class people. Until recently in India, at least, everybody used to take baths early in the morning and do some puja or something like that. Now, by the influence of TV, times have changed. People stay up late and they get up late. But uh, many of the things followed by non-devotees and devotees are the same. The difference is that the non-devotees, they do these things ultimately for their own sense gratification. Either they're thinking of becoming pious so they can enjoy material happiness, or they do these things because they're thinking, ultimately I will get mukti, I will get liberated from it. But a devotee does these things for the pleasure of Krishna. He likes to rise early so that he can take advantage of the Brahma Mahurta, which is the best time for engaging in sadhana, in the service of Krishna, and so that his body will be fresh and pure, and healthy for the service of Krishna. He takes early morning bath. Everything is done for the pleasure of Krishna. And, and basically the activities of Krishna conscious, they are in the mode of goodness. They are activities of the mode of goodness. But if a devotee does everything for the pleasure of Krishna, it's not actually in goodness, but it lifts one up to the platform of uh, Shuddha Sattva, purified goodness or Krishna consciousness. So these are some basic principles of Krishna conscious understanding. Let us try to understand them. In this way we can come to the mode of goodness and go beyond that to the standard of Krishna consciousness. Krishna consciousness is very simple, but we have to hear regularly just to keep our understanding clear and purified. So we're discussing some basic points of the mode of goodness and the need to go beyond that to become Krishna conscious. So if there are any questions, we can take them now. And my question is, just, um, some clarification. There was a question this morning about, well, how should we preach to devotees who are doubtful about following all these principles? So I had some more discussion with Shadbuj Prabhu about this. So he was saying that um, it's like new, it's how to, what to say to new people who come 
who express like that. So my reply was that we shouldn't. There's no need to push people into taking up Krishna consciousness. You don't have to pressurize them. Don't eat meat and don't have illicit sex and all these things. You don't have to pressurize people to come and live in the temple and follow all our rules and regulations. Let them become convinced and then take it up voluntarily and happily. If you try to force people, that won't work. Now, of course, sometimes we, we do preach to people strongly and then they just change. But you have to know when to do that. It's just like if an apple is completely ripe, mm. you give it a little a little pull and it'll come off the tree. Yes. But if it's not ripe, it's not ready to pull, it's not ready to be pulled, you can pull it and with a lot of effort it'll come off, but it still won't be ripe. Yes. So in, in the same way, at a certain point in a person's spiritual cultivation, if you tell them, come on, why don't you take it up now? So you put a little pressure, that will be very fruitful. But if in the beginning, when people are just becoming interested, and uh, they don't really have that much faith in Krishna consciousness or much taste for it. If at that point you pressurize them to follow very seriously, it probably won't be effective. It may have the opposite result. So let people come and hear and take prasadam and join in the chanting and uh, according to their own ability to pick up Krishna consciousness, they will do so. So although some pressure may be there, Prabhupada said this is a pushing movement, but ultimately Krishna consciousness is a voluntary process. So if someone doesn't take up Krishna consciousness with the, from their own desire, then there's not much point to try and force people into doing it. Krishna consciousness is by its own nature attractive. Those who are fortunate will be attracted. Those who are less fortunate, give them prasad. Because mostly, however unfortunate people are, they appreciate prasadam. Sometimes people are extremely impious and unfortunate and they don't like prasadam either. They don't like it. You yeah. see, he doesn't need surprise. You can't imagine someone who doesn't like prasadam. But yeah. There are such people, maybe not so many in your country. Maybe these people are fairly pious people, relatively so. You know, it may be some piety also. I mean, quite frankly, generally I would say that the Catholic countries, there, they tend to be more pious in accepting Christian consciousness. Now, whatever we may say about the Roman Catholic Church, it's generally better than the, uh, like the Protestant Church. The, they're, it's more personal and devotional. And we, we definitely see that generally in the, uh, the Catholic countries all over the world. People have, they, they can take up bhakti, Krishna bhakti more easily. Just like, for instance, in Russia, you you do find quite a lot of like severely demoniac people but who sure. won't take prasadam even. Yesterday, I was at the transit desk in Moscow to get my boarding pass for flying to Vilnius. So I was just chanting very quietly, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Just like that, no louder. And you know, other people were talking among themselves louder than me. But one of the Aeroflot staff said, "Hey, could you just stop?" Just stop making that noise. Okay, so, uh, you, you don't like it? He put this lock on. Like it's the most horrible thing in the world. He's in. He had no reason to be disturbed. Except he had no reason to be disturbed. I wasn't making a loud noise. But he was just disturbed because he didn't like to hear the name of Krishna even very slightly. So such people, even if you give them prasadam, they won't take it. But most people are not that demoniac. And even though he's a demon, he heard the name of Krishna. That's why he didn't like to hear it, but he already heard it. So, it's too late. so some purification is there. Jai Hare Krishna. So um, this morning there are many questions. So if you all have more questions, we can have some more questions and answers after Arati. Otherwise, we could sing a few bhajans, or otherwise a mixture of both, as you like. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Śrīla Prabhupāda ki jai, Śrī Śrīnitāya Gaurachandra ki jai. I hope the Russian devotees here don't feel offended thinking I was making some anti-Russian statements there. No, just translate what I said. Say, you say I was saying that there appear to be many more demons born in Russia ah, than yeah. in Lithuania. Of course, there are many nice devotees there also. Just like uh, Prahlad and, and Hiranyakashipu were born in the same family. So we're not, we're not anti-Russian. We like devotees wherever they come from and we don't like demons. We have to make them devotees also. But it's it's easier to make people devotees if they're naturally inclined to take prasadam and chant Hare Krishna. It's more difficult when they become upset when, when you chant Hare Krishna and they refuse to take prasadam. So Hare Krishna, some questions. It's not necessarily just by being sincere that you're beyond the three modes of material nature. Sincere may mean that you're seriously trying. But trying and actually having reached the goal are not synonymous. So what role does sincerity have? 
central to Krishna consciousness. There's no meaning to Krishna consciousness without being sincere. Sincere means to seriously try to practice Krishna consciousness for the pleasure of Krishna without any personal desire. However, it's not so easy to be free from material desires. So even though we may be sincerely trying, we may fall under the influence of the modes of material nature again and again. But then our sincerity will be seen in how we again and again reapply ourselves to the process of Krishna consciousness. And this lady has another question. I have many questions, but I don't know how much you're understanding the answers. Are you studying Srila Prabhupada's book? Which books have you read? You see, it's, it's very difficult to ask any proper question about a subject unless you have some basic knowledge. Have you studied atomic physics? So, if you were to ask some questions about atomic physics, you couldn't really ask any proper questions unless you have at least some initial knowledge. So, I would suggest at this stage that you go on with your very nice, sincere service and you study Prabhupada's books very carefully and you listen to the classes very carefully. Just try to understand basically at this stage and then afterwards it may be better to ask some questions. I think has a very, very simple question. Yeah, but if you're, if you're, uh, if you're not properly ready to receive the answer, it may be a simple question, but it may not be properly received anyway. So I, I really think at this stage, for you in particular, it's better you hear and study and serve. That will be better. Okay. So someone else has some questions. Uh, well, so it's the mode of goodness and the Brahma Bhutta stage, practically they're the same. The developed stage of Brahma Bhutta is to understand that all living beings are parts and parcels of Krishna. To see the equality of all living beings is one stage, but then to, to understand what is their constitutional position that is further developed understanding. Brahma Bhutta Prasanat Nana Shochati Nakangshati Samasarveshu Bhuteshu Mad Bhaktim Navate Param. On the Brahma Bhutta stage, one sees all living beings as equal, but then from that stage, Mad Bhaktim Labhate, from that stage he has to go up to the stage of becoming a devotee of Krishna. Cultivation of the mode of goodness brings one up to the Brahma Bhutta stage, and when one is more fully developed in that, he comes to the stage of Krishna consciousness. Anyway, as I was saying in the class, no one here is going up through the mode of goodness to Brahma Bhutta, to Krishna consciousness. By the mercy of Lord Chaitanya, we're being picked up from the mode of ignorance and being given the chance to serve Krishna. Special mercy. It works the other way around too. Bhakti Ovya Bicharena Bhakti Ogena Sevate Sagunan Samatit Chaitan Brahma Bhuyaya Kalpate. If one, from any position, if one takes to devotional service, unwavering devotional service, then he crosses over the modes of material nature and thus is automatically situated on the Brahma Bhutta platform. Then Krishna consciousness takes every situation on the basis of Anukulyena what is that? Anukulyena Anukulyasya Sankalpa Pratikulyasya Varjanam. In every situation he simply thinks how to serve Krishna favorably and he rejects all possibilities of uh, whatever is unfavorable to devotional service, he rejects that. So, on the platform of neutrality, one may, on the platform of the mode of goodness, one may be simple, simply neutral. But in Krishna conscious, one is, he comes to the positive position of engaging everything in Krishna's service. He's neither attached to anything materially, nor is he unnecessarily detached. Personally, he's detached from everything, but he wants to use everything in Krishna's service. A person in the mode of goodness may be offered a million dollars and he'll say no. But a pure devotee will say, yes, give me more. We have to do a lot of things for Krishna. You have to build temples, print books, distribute prasadam. Why only a million dollars? Give more. So he's not personally attached, but for the sake of Krishna's service, he's attached to using everything in Krishna's service. Anasaktasya vishayan yathaham upayunjataha nirbandha krishna sambande yuktam vairagya mujjati When one is not attached to anything personally, but he uses everything in Krishna's service, 
That is called properly applied renunciation. If you see a contradiction, you made a mistake. It's just that you don't understand it. The same point that I was discussing in the class today. The ultimate state of the modernness is Krishna consciousness. You'll see that this verse describes a person in the mode of goodness. So Prabhupada starts the purport by describing a person in Krishna consciousness. So the ultimate stage of the mode of goodness is Krishna consciousness, which is... The ordinary mode of goodness is the uh, in t still part of the entanglement of the material modes. That is ultimately meant to take us above the modes of material nature. So from the logical point of view, if you read this, it may appear that there's a contradiction. You have to understand the spirit in which it's written. The mode of goodness is meant to take us to the transcendental position. And when one is actually transcendental to the modes of nature, he can be said to be perfectly in the mode of goodness. Just like for instance, sometimes we'd speak of Prabhupada how he was perfectly in the mode of goodness. Now, that doesn't mean that he's contaminated by the material modes. That means to describe his transcendental qualities, how he's not attached to anything material, he doesn't lament under any circumstances. This is a perfect description of the mode of goodness. Of course, as, one, as long as one is only in the mode of goodness, then he is liable to be... Uh, if, if one is in the mode of goodness without Krishna consciousness, then he's liable to fall down into the lower modes. But the mode of goodness, uh, when, when a person in Krishna consciousness, a fully Krishna conscious person, he is the emblem of the mode of goodness. Actually, these descriptions of the mode of goodness, liberated from all material association, without false ego, with determination, with enthusiasm, that's only possible, fully possible, if someone's in Krishna consciousness. So when Krishna says that Muktos, mukta sangha, and then he says karta sattvika muchate, that he says that a person is free from the modes of material nature, he's a worker in the mode of goodness. A Krishna knows what he's talking about, and it appears that Arjuna understood him also. Maybe Krishna and Arjuna were conducting their discussion on a higher level of understanding than you've come to yet. The logicians will find so many mistakes in the Shastra. They don't get Krishna. They don't develop any of these qualities either. Do you understand that point? Do you understand that point? It said that he is perfect. So does it mean that he doesn't make mistakes? The, the four symptoms of the liberated soul are or viprilips what is that? Brahmad Vipralipsa Karana Patav Arya Vigyavaki Nahidoshi Shab. The four mistakes of the conditioned souls are that he makes mistakes, he's illusioned, cheating propensity, and has imperfect senses. So those who are on the perfect platform, they're beyond these propensities. Now, as I was saying in the class, if one, even a pure devotee, if he's in this material world, he's not fully free from the influence of the material world. Just like, for instance, if he goes out in the rain, he'll get wet. So, that's a gross example, but even on a more subtle level, the material nature may influence him. Just like, for instance, Prabhupada was speaking English, but his English grammar wasn't perfect. So you could say, well, he made mistakes. But when it's said that a pure devotee doesn't make mistakes, that means his understanding of Vaishnav Siddhanta is beyond mistakes. So yes, a perfect person doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't make the mistake of identifying with the body. He doesn't make the mistake of forgetting Krishna. He doesn't make mistakes. This is an important point, especially at the present time, because there's a lot of propaganda going around that Prabhupada made mistakes, which uh, I hate to say, but it's actually very demoniac. Prabhupada said, my only mistake was that I made so many stupid, mis foolish disciples. And that's not a mistake, that's his mercy. But uh, Prabhupada gave us so many different programs. If we didn't carry them out properly, that's our fault, not Prabhupada's fault. So you start saying, Prabhupada made mistakes, and next thing you say, Krishna made mistakes. You just become an atheist, that's all. Maha prasade govinde nama brahmane vaishnave svalpam punyavatam rajan vishwasa naivate jayate. People of very limited pious activities, they cannot appreciate the transcendental nature of Mahaprasad, of Govinda, of the Holy Name, or of the Vaishnavas. They take them to be something material. Govinda also, they say Krishna is material. 
So be careful. If you want to be very logical, rational and empirical, you can find out so many things wrong with Krishna consciousness. No, you may become very somebody. intelligent, but you'll, um, uh, you'll end up as a worm in stool if you're lucky. That's about the highest position you'll get. It's not a joke, it's a very, very serious thing to they blaspheme the pure devotees. Or to apply your own stupid, foolish intelligence to try to judge the Vaishnavas on the material platform. About Vaishnavas. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Be careful. We have to hear about Krishna from devotees. Don't hear about Krishna from non-devotees. That's another big, big fashion among the more insane section of our society at the present time. See, in our movement, there's always some kind of tangent. What means tangent? In geometry, there's parallel line and tangential lines. The tangent means there's a line going straight and there's a line which just goes off a little bit. Okay, yeah. Okay. You don't say tangent, it sounds like a Latin word. There's always some kind of fantastic new idea that someone's dreamed up. The Krishna consciousness is very, very simple. You chant Hare Krishna, to associate with devotees. Take Krishna Prasad and accept the Shastra as Arjuna accepted it. Sarvameta Dritang Manye Yanman Varasikeshava. Arjuna said to Krishna, I accept everything you say, Krishna. On that basis of faith in Guru, Sadhu and Shastra, Srila Prabhupada spread Krishna consciousness all over the world. But due to the influence of insanity, uh, some people who come to Krishna consciousness dream up some new ideas. So if you ever come across any new ideas which are not those given to us by Prabhupada, you can immediately put them in the trash can, garbage can, they're all useless. So the present fantastic wonderful idea going around at the present time is that we should try and understand Krishna consciousness from the mundane scholars. This probably doesn't reach this way, but you know, there's always someone somewhere trying to do something different. So now the big fashion among certain people is to go to big, big scholars who may be very learned in some areas of Vaishnavism, actually. They may know many things about the history of Vaishnavism or about Sanskrit grammar. The only problem is that they're demons. They don't have faith in Krishna. And they always explain Shastra in such a way as to make Krishna look mundane. Just like in Prabhupada's books, you'll always find written, Krishna is the Supreme Personality of God. It's straightforward, clear. But in the scholars' books, you'll find that it is said that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of God. You see the difference? So you'll find some of our supposed to be devotees, they've taken up this very scholarly style of writing. According to some, Krishna appeared in the... According to some Gorya Vaishnav sources, Krishna appeared in this world 5,000 years ago. In other words, they don't have faith, but they, they're just writing that, you know, well, maybe it was like this. So they think, well, this is very good. Yeah. Now the big scholar will write a review of my book and write that this is a very scholarly writing. Pat you on the head. And you might even get a university degree. Yeah, you okay. can put uh, one of these funny hats, you know, this <laughs> hat and, and, it, and go up <laughs> and be given a degree by a big meat eater and wine drinker and woman hunter. And you can advertise yourself as being very advanced in the knowledge that will take you to hell very quickly. So just for your information, this is the latest deviation. And they're coming up with ideas that that, well, you know, maybe what in Shastra is not exactly correct. Uh, how, just like, how can you accept that Prabhupada insists that the moon is further away than the sun? We can't put that, we can't accept that, otherwise, you know, the scholars will laugh at us. So that's a good idea, isn't it? We, we shouldn't really accept that the moon is further away than the sun. Of course, if you, if you want to change the Shastra because you're afraid of what the scientists will say, uh, you're going to have a lot of editing to do. A lot of editing. If you want to cut out the things out of Bhagavatam that don't, the scientists don't agree with, then you can make the whole Bhagavatam in three pages. Actually, it's difficult to, it's difficult to think how you'd even get three pages. It's difficult to think how you'd even get three pages. I'm just you're trying to think of something that the scientists might agree with. I can't think of anything yet. So we can just distribute blank books. 
get more points mm. you can tell people this is a very spiritual book you see it's got no pages and it's got no writing <laughs> and you just open it up and then you just imagine whatever you like oh really you're oh, very, very spiritual give me ten of them so Prabhupada's idea was to kick the scientists in the face with boots Kick the mundane scholars in the face with boots. And this is the language Prabhupada used. <laughs> the, the Prabhupada. You know, don't go saying, you know, this Bhaktivika Swami is so heavy, gives all these heavy classes. I'm just saying what Prabhupada said. If you don't like it, then, you know, too bad. You know, to tell the truth, I never heard any, I've heard, I, I've either heard or read every single one of Prabhupada's letters uh, and, and conversations and lectures, and I don't see him talking about, you know, Krishna's wandering in the fields with the gopis. I don't find this. This is not Prabhupada's mood. This may be very nice for cheating people who imagine themselves to be on some artificial level of spiritual advancement, which they're not on. But the real work of preaching Krishna consciousness is to establish the Shastra in the world among all these demons who have no faith in it. So you'll find Prabhupada using the word rascal, fool, nonsense, demon, all these words much more than you'll find the word gopi. That's a fact. So Prabhupada wanted to kick these rascal scholars in the face with boots. Not that we put our face at their boots and lick them. Give me PhD. Prabhupada said PhD means plow department. Plow, de plow department. You should get a plow and go and plow the fields. Uh, I, I don't know. So keep straightforward in Krishna consciousness. Chan Hare Krishna, take Prasad, study Prabhupada's books, don't try to become a gopi artificially, don't, uh, don't think there's another stupid idea going around that, you know, all our devotees, they should become, they should get university degrees and then, then people will listen to us when we preach. So all our devotees should go to college and get a degree. And then people will listen to us. Another stupid idea. When you start to preach to people, do they start asking, well, do you have a university degree? If you're convinced, you can convince others. If you're not convinced, you can be Professor Einstein. Einstein wouldn't convince anyone about Krishna consciousness because he wasn't convinced himself. In yeah. fact, people who think you have to have a university degree to preach to others, that means already they're not convinced. They'll never be able to convince others. So don't be a victim of all these stupid ideas. If you study Prabhupada's books, you can meet with any scholar. doesn't matter. In any way, who cares for all these stupid scholars? You know, most of the people in the street, they, even they don't care for scholars. They're just a bunch of cheaters anyway. Mostly the scholars, they're the most degraded people anyway. You know, they all uh, victimize all the young girls in the college. The stupid girls think, if I sleep with the professor, he'll give me good marks and I don't have to work. And this is the fact. There's so many Thai devotees, when they were distributing sets of Prabhupada's books in the colleges in America, they found that so many of the scholars, they're just drunkards, that's all. Drunkards and debauchees. Really. I'm not just saying it to... Uh, I'm not just saying it to give them a bad name. I mean, it's a fact. Now, it's also true that Prabhupada wanted that our movement would be recognized by scholars. But there was, that we, pr there was so many hundreds of reviews from scholars appreciating Prabhupada's books. And right in Prabhupada's books, it, again and again, it says that Prabhupada writes that academic scholars are just big demons. Yeah. And all these things, that the moon is further away than the sun, and all these things, because right in the books, and the, the scholars were appreciated. Because they could appreciate that this is the authentic thing. If you start watering it down, then you just get water, that's all. Putting water in the milk. In India, often you'll find the people who sell milk, they put a little water in because you can't tell, it looks the same. So don't put water in the milk. Krishna conscious is pure and powerful, you don't have to change it. You don't need anything material to become Krishna conscious or to preach Krishna consciousness. If you have a university degree, okay, that's nice. Don't, don't worry about it. It's just like, you know, if you're going for preaching, it's good if you're dressed a little neatly, you don't look like a, like a completely scruffy person. But even if you're perfectly dressed, if you don't know the philosophy of Krishna consciousness, you don't have any faith in Krishna, then how are you going to preach? So some material facility, that may help, but the essence is Krishna consciousness. People were surprised when Prabhupada spread Krishna consciousness all over the world. No one thought he could be successful. Because from the material point of view, it was not possible. How could an old man from India have any influence in America which is the capital of materialism, and where the whole culture was based on meat-eating, illicit sex, intoxication and gambling. Why should they be interested in Krishna consciousness? Prabhupada is the living proof 
that you don't need any material facility to spread Krishna consciousness, that ultimately purity is the force. Now later, of course, money, followers, facilities, all things came, and Prabhupada used them in Krishna's service. But the ultimate force is the faith in Krishna. Okay, I think we'll finish there.